Welcome to TSAT. Today we will be discussing the first topic of Indian economy, measures of national income and growth. Why is national income the first topic when it comes to Indian economy? If you want to know the economic well-being of any person, what is the first thing that we would like to know is the income of that particular individual. It's as simple as that. If your friend happens to drive a Ferrari, what do you think is the first thing you would like to know? How rich that person could be and how much money he is making. And that being the reason, the first and foremost topic that we will be discussing as part of this series is the income of this nation. So what do you mean by? We all know about what is personal income. The income that you and me makes through different means. Okay, The income that you make in the form of interest from your bank deposits, the salary that you earn per month or simply the money that you make from stock markets. There could be multiple sources of income to an individual. But what is an income of a nation? Nation simply represents its people, isn't it? I mean, the people of that particular country is nothing but okay, the nation, isn't it? So when it comes to the income of a nation, the income that you make and I make and the, okay, whoever happens to be the people that belong to this particular nation is what we could simply call as a national income. So now let's go ahead and define what exactly is the national income. But before going ahead, let me define the different types of goods and services that we will be using it to understand the concept of national income. Let's say here you have four different images. Imagine the first okay, image here in this case, you have cotton. Let's say a farmer produces this cotton. The farmer cultivates a cash crop cotton and this farmer okay, is selling this particular cotton to a company which transforms this cotton into yarn. So imagine there is a company which purchases this cotton, which purchases the cotton from a farmer and I call this as a raw material for the company or input or input for the company, input for the company. So what does this company does? This company transforms cotton into yarn and this yarn that is being produced by this company is what we call it as a finished product, what we call it as a finished product product. So the reason why I call it a finished product is because this is a product that is been ready to be sold. The processing in the factory is been complete and this product is ready to be sold. So this is the company which only transforms cotton into yarn. And now imagine there is a company that purchases this yarn as an input and transform this yarn into a, a cloth. So now this cloth is the output and the yarn purchased is an input. And this particular cloth produced by this company now again could be called as a finished product. So what do you mean by a finished product? The product that has been out of processing and ready to be sold is what we call it as a finished product. Now imagine some of, okay, some part of this cloth, let us say out of this entire cloth, let us say some four or five pieces are being purchased by an individual like you or me. Imagine an individual like you or me purchase some five pieces of cloth. And why do you buy this cloth? To get it stretched and turn it and okay, turn it into a garment, isn't it? So we wanted to get it stretched. So why would an individual buy a cloth to get it stretched for his clothing? And let us say some part of this cloth has been purchased by a company. Just imagine any company, any shirts or trouser making company and that company's job is to transform this cloth into a trouser or a shirt and okay, it would sell this final output that is uh, the shirt in the market. Now if you look at that particular piece of cloth that you or me who purchased for the sake of getting it stitched and using it for ourselves, we call that particular pieces of cloth as a in final good. Whereas those, those pieces of cloth that has been purchased by a company for the sake of transforming into a shirt and selling in the market is what we call it as intermediate good. So now I hope you understand the difference between a final good and an intermediate good. A final good is a good that is meant for final consumption. A final good is simply a good that is meant for final consumption. Whereas an intermediate good is a good that gets transformed into a finished product or some final good. Okay? So the reason why the same piece of cloth when I purchase is called as a final good, when it is purchased by a co company 
is called as an intermediate good is simple the company is transforming this cotton into a shirt and that is the final good that is the shirt okay is what is been sold by the company to the market so the same cloth which is finished good could be called as final good if it is meant for final consumption and it is called as intermediate good if it is further used in a process of any economic activity so now let's go ahead and let's look at the other type of goods now here in this case imagine if you have a shirt and here in this case you have a printing machine so we have seen finished good final good and intermediate good now let's look at consumer good and capital good a consumer good is the good that is meant for consumption by households like you and me so the pen i am using could be called as a consumer good the shirt i am wearing is a consumer good the mobile phone you and me purchasing is a consumer good but whereas capital good like here in this case the printer is a called as a capital good because this is a good that is used to produce any other goods and services so here in this case this printer is used to print books then you might be asking what's the difference between intermediate good and a capital good an intermediate good is the good that is exhausted in the process of production let's say imagine if you are buying some tea powder from a branded outlet the tea powder that we purchase from an outlet is what we call as a final good if a tea stall owner buys the same tea powder it is called as an intermediate good because he transforms the tea or he uses the tea tea powder to make a final good or to make a finished product that is nothing but tea so that tea powder used by or purchased by the tea stall guy is an intermediate good that same tea powder that you or me purchasing from the outlet could be called as a final good then how is this tea powder because the tea powder in this case the intermediate good is also used to produce some other good similarly a printer is also used to produce books so both the goods are used to produce various other goods then what's the difference between intermediate good and a capital good intermediate goods are the goods that are consumed or that are exhausted in the process of production does mean the tea powder that is used to produce a tea could no longer be used for i mean you cannot use the same tea powder for making the next and third and fourth tea right but whereas the stove that the tea stall guy uses to make the tea could be used for n number of times similarly this printer or the copier could be used n number of times you don't print only one copy using a printer right so you would be using this printer for almost 2 3 years or at least for 5 10 years to print large number of books hundreds and thousands of books so the printer doesn't get exhausted for every book you print but the paper you might be using the ink you might be using to print the book gets exhausted that could not be no longer further reused and hence for the paper the ink that we used to print a book is an intermediate good but the printer that is used to print the book is a capital good so now i think you know the difference between a finished good a finished product is a product that has been okay out of production process and ready to be sold final good is the good that is meant for final consumption or no further economic activity takes place using that particular product and intermediate good is a good that is used to produce any other goods and services consumer goods are the good that are meant for final consumption by households like you and me capital goods are the good that are used to produce any other kind of goods either it is a consumer good or any kind of commodity and the last difference between okay with the, the last type of goods is a durable and non durable goods durable and non durable so durability has been shelf life so for how long term you could use this so if you look at on the right side you could find some vegetables and fruits these are the typical examples of durable goods sorry non durable goods isn't it the printer is a durable good because it would be it could be used i mean its life span or its shelf life is for a longer span of time whereas these particular foods and vegetables until unless you don't have a proper refrigerator you cannot keep it for okay for more than 2 3 days isn't it and hence for these particular goods have a very less shelf life we call them as a non durable so a tv okay the television set that you are using to watch this video is a consumer durable that could be called as the shirt that you would be using is a consumer durable the mobile phone is a consumer durable but an apple that you purchase from the market is a consumer good and it's a non durable good so i hope you understand the difference between various types of goods and it is very essential to understand the difference between various types of goods to measure the or to understand the definition of a national income now let's go ahead and look at the second most important part of understanding the concept of national income and this is what i call as a factors of production what do you mean by factors of production factors of production are what we call as the quintessential elements to produce any other goods and services i mean if you want to produce any marker a chalk piece anything no matter whatever the commodity that we will produce a good or a service 
the most essential elements required to produce these goods and services is what we call factors of production or you could call them as a means of a production means of a production i think you understand the difference between the terms means and ends right so here are the four factors of production that we would be commonly referring and whenever i use the term called land generally people have a perception whenever people use something as a land we believe that the land the zameen that we are using to construct a building or simply to cultivate is what we believe as land or what corresponds to this particular factors of production called land but when it comes to the term land it refers to all the natural factors let's say if you are having a thermal power company and what does your company does your company uses coal to produce some power so your company requires land for the power plant and similarly your company also requires coal to convert this coal into electricity isn't it so the coal you use the land upon which you build the factory everything would be generally referred as one factor of production that is nothing but a land so land doesn't correspond to only the zameen that we are been using it isn't it so anything that is available from the nature is what we happen to represent through a term called land and when it comes to the second most important labor so labor refers to any human factor so it could be a skilled labor unskilled labor semi skilled labor no matter any human factor we represent or we happen to connote with the term called labor and when it comes to capital so again people have a perception capital refers to only money no capital refers to capital is a very broader term that refers to anything that is man made the technology the building that you would be okay that we are recording it that's a capital the money that we require to record this particular lectures that's a capital and the technology we are using it is again a capital so anything that is man made okay could be called as a, could be referred using a term called capital and the last the most important is the entrepreneur or the enterprising skill why is an entrepreneur very much required is simple imagine in the absence of okay the government who which doesn't take the initiative to record these videos you would not be having this tsat and you would not be having these classes that has been delivered so someone going to take the initiative someone need to take the initiative isn't it if there was no such company or do no particular businessman okay you would not be having these goods and services produced isn't it the particular television set we are using if that company doesn't do this or the owner of the company doesn't mobilize the resources we would not be having this kind of a output so that's the basic reason an entrepreneur or enterprising skill is of utmost important to produce any types of goods and services so in general anything that is required to produce goods and services we use a term called land labor capital entrepreneurship and these are what we call factors of production and when these factors of production are employed these particular owners of the factors of production do need to be compensated it's as simple as that let's say i'm spending some the next 5 6 hours of time with you people delivering an economy lecture if i spend the same time first doing i mean doing something else i might have been paid but leaving that opportunity i am taking the classes for you so henceforth i need to be compensated for the 3 4 hours of time i am giving it to you people and that compensation one gets paid is what i call as a factor income and don't you consider myself as a labor so i am a human being and i am delivering a lecture and i need to be compensated for the time i am simply giving it to you people and that compensation that i get paid is what i could refer as a, a wage or a salary if i am a salaried employee of this is said then i could call it the money they are paying to me as a salary similarly if i am using someone a land to construct a factory or if i have taken someone's land for a lease to build a factory then i need to compensate the owner of the land because if the same land would have been cultivated by the farmer it would have been yielding certain amount of output for him isn't it so if you employ the factors of production these owners of factors of production need to be compensated and that compensation you pay to the land owner is what we refer using a term called rent and the compensation the capitalist gets paid at the one who happens to give you the money okay lends money is what we call a interest and the compensation paid to the labor is what we call as a wages and the compensation the business person or the entrepreneur gets paid is what is called profit so these are the four factors of production on my left hand side and these are four referred as a factor income income earned by the factors of production or you could call a factor payments made by the entrepreneur to the respective facts of production so having seen the different facts of production now let's define the national income what do you mean by national income the typical definition of national income is that the labor and capital of a country 
acting on the resources produce some output. Let us say in a country of 4 people, just imagine to make things simple, let us imagine there are 4 people in a country. Of course, this seems to be very absurd, but just imagine, let us make things simple. There are 4 people in a country and all these 4 people together do come, okay, do mobilize the resources in that particular country and do produce some output. And in the process of producing this output, these 4 people might have been paid. And imagine those are the 4 people who owns the land, those are the 4 people who owns the, one person owns the land, the other person is the labor, the third person is the one who owns the capital and the fourth person is the businessman who mobilized all these uh, resources. Now, imagine if all these four people come together and do produce some output. The what of output is what we call as a, the output of the nation or the national product. And in the process of producing this output, maybe a pen, maybe a chocolate, maybe a shirt, no matter whatever the output pro they produce. In the process of producing this output, these four facts of production would be paid certain amount of money. And the amount of money that all these four facts of production gets paid is what we call as income of those four people. And since this nation has only four people, can I simply call the income of all these four people is nothing but the income of the nation, isn't it? Because the nation corresponds to uh, represents uh, the people, isn't it? So, income of uh, the nation. And whatever the output they have produced, you express in terms of uh, some market value, we call it as a national output or national product. And now let us say these people together working on the resources has produced some 100 rupees worth chocolates. If they ended up producing 100 rupees worth chocolates, does mean the output worth is 100 rupees. It does mean at what price do you think these people would be selling it to the market at 100 rupees. Whosoever buys these chocolates, what do you think is the expenditure made by the people who buys this 100 rupees worth chocolates? It is going to be again rupees 100. So, if you produce an output worth 100, you are going to sell it for 100. So, the one who buys it is going to make a spending of 100 rupees for 100 rupees chocolates, is not it? And henceforth, typically people say in any nation, the income of the nation is equal to the output of the nation or the okay, national product or what we call as a, okay, the same thing could also be equated to national expenditure. In fact, most of you would have a doubt, how come income could be equated to expenditure? How come income? could be equated to expenditure. But do not you really think that your income is someone else's expenditure? How do I make money? My money that I am making is someone else's expenditure, is not it? And that is the basic reason never ever get confused how an income could be equated to expenditure because your income is someone else's expenditure and your expenditure is going to be someone else's income. So, typically in a particular nation, whatever is the worth of output produced would always be equal to the amount of income that people make during the production process would always be equal to the amount of money people spend upon the goods and services that these people produce. And that is the reason in any economy, you could simply say the national income is equal to the national output is equal to national expenditure. Okay. Now, let us look at the three different methods of measuring national income. So, since I already happened to give you the fact that in any particular economy, the national income is equal to the national output is equal to national expenditure, that is the reason we have three different methods of measuring national income. That is income method, output method or production method or you could call survey, okay? output method or production method and a expenditure method. So, what do you mean by it? It is simple. Okay, what do you mean by income method? It is simply how would you calculate okay, through income method? It is simply a sum of the factor income earned, the factor income earned by all the nationals or by all the people of this country, by all the people of this country. Does mean the money I make in the form of salary, the money you make in the form of interest, the money someone else is making in the form of rents, the money someone else, some profit or okay, enterprise is making. So, sum of individuals income of all the people of that particular nation. Okay, if I happen to account it, then I call that is a process that is being used and that is what we call income method. The third, let us look at the expenditure method. Expenditure method does mean whatever is the expenditure made, okay, the consumption expenditure made by the individuals, the expenditure made by the investors, the expenditure made by the government. So, whatever is the expenditure made by all those people who ever happen to expend some money or who are make some okay, expenditure upon various goods and services. So, some of the expenditure made upon various goods and services by all the economic agents of a country, then we could say that, okay, that particular method used as an expenditure method. And when we are spending some money upon goods and services, does mean we are spending money on the goods and services produced. So, if you sum up the value of goods and services or worth of all goods and services produced, worth of all goods and services produced in the economy, okay, 
that is what I call the uh, output method. So, the total worth of uh, output uh, that this particular nation has produced. So, that is how no matter whatever the method you use, uh, you will be getting the same number and that is what we could call as a uh, national income. So, the second and the most important part of this because these days you might be aware of the fact since 2015 in India we started measuring the GDP using a very new method called gross value addition method. So, let us try to understand the concept of value addition. Generally, people have the perception of value addition. Value addition does mean transforming some x into y or transforming in the previous slide I have shown you transforming cotton. Cotton has been transformed into yarn. People believe yes, cotton has changed into yarn and yarn happened to change it to a cloth and cloth happened to change it to a shirt or a trouser, is not it? So, some x has been transformed to y and that is what is the perception of many people that this is what we call value addition. Of course, cotton has changed its form into yarn, yarn has changed its form into cloth and cloth has been changed to a different form that is a shirt. So, every time there is a value addition, but value addition does not necessarily mean that a good has to experience a change in form, no. The definition of value addition is the contribution of labor and capital. The contribution of labor and capital during any stage a particular product happens to undergo. That is what we call a value addition. Now, let us say the shirt has been produced by the factory. And what is the value addition of this factory? A cloth has been transformed to a shirt. That is the value addition of the factory. Now, imagine a distributor buys this particular shirt a distributor buys a large number of these shirts for the sake of distributing to the retail outlets. And do not you really think this distributor is again purchasing a finished product that is nothing but a shirt. And what is that he is delivering to the market okay, to the retailers, he is again delivering a same shirt, okay, is not it? So, there is no change in form here in this case, it is the same shirt the distributor is purchasing from the factory is what he is selling it to the retailers. The shirt has not changed any form, then is there any value addition? Definitely. And what kind of value addition? Because this distributor to purchase the shirt from the factory to the time okay, he delivers it to retailer, he needs to spend money upon labor, he needs to spend money upon transportation, he needs to spend money upon warehousing, good answers, is not it? So, that is the basic reason the contribution of this distributor okay, or the money that this distributor spends upon the labor and various other resources for okay, from the time he purchases the shirt from the factory to the time he delivers to the retail outlet is what we call it as a value addition. So, do not be under the impression that value addition does mean a product or a service has to transform into a different product. No, any contribution of labor and capital during any particular stage a product happened to undergo would be called as value addition. So, how would you measure value addition? The formula for computing value addition is the price of output, the price of output minus the cost of intermediate consumption or you could simply call it the cost of raw materials or inputs, cost of intermediate consumption. So, that is what we call it as a value addition. So, now imagine here in this particular example, let us say in the first stage, let us imagine this is the first stage of a production of a shirt. There is a company which purchases cotton worth rupees 100 from a farmer. And once this company has purchased cotton worth rupees 100 from a farmer, they have spent some money upon the labor and capital and transformed this cotton into yarn. And finally, this yarn is what they happen to sell it at a price 200. So, what is the value addition in this case? That is 200 rupees minus 100. So, that is the worth of value addition taking place in the first stage. In the second stage, what is the other company happen to do? They happen to purchase yarn at a price of rupees 200 from this factory and transform the yarn into a cloth and this cloth is what imagine they sold at 400 rupees to the market. So, what is the valuation in the second stage? It is 400 that is the output minus the previous I mean value of input that is 200. So, what is the valuation? That is 200. Now, this cloth has been purchased by other factory let us say at 400 rupees right. And this particular okay, company has transformed this cloth worth 400 into a 700 rupees worth shirt. Let us say finally, a 700 rupees worth shirt is being sold it to a consumer. So, now finally, what is the value of final output that is a final good rupees 700. So, a 700 shirt has been produced, is not it? So, this is the final good that this okay, and imagine this particular shirt has been purchased by you or me. In such case, this is the final good that this particular economy has produced and what is the worth of the final good? Rupees 700. 
but in this case what is the valuation in the third stage? It is 700 minus 400 the money spent upon the cloth. So, how much it is 300 and now sum up the value addition ok is not it now sum up the value addition I mean value added in all different stages is not it. So, what we will be getting is the 100 rupees worth the cotton initially from the farmer because the farmer has produced 100 rupees worth the cotton that is the value addition for the farmer and the second stage there is a value addition by the company that forms from cotton into yarn and then you have 200. So, if you look at the value addition all these successive stages the total value addition worth is 700 and this is generally how we measure income of a nation or GDP using value addition. So, simply speaking the modern method of computing GDP using value addition is nothing but a gross value added in all sectors of the economy agriculture sector, industrial sector, service sector. So, value added at each and every stage in all sectors of the economy okay, at market prices is generally what we refer to as a GDP. Okay. So, in this particular lecture we have discussed about the different types of goods and factors of production, what is the method of measuring national income, what exactly is the definition of national income and the concept of a value addition. And we will continue with the next lecture where we will be discussing about different measures of income okay, that is GDP, GNP and the rest. Okay.